Like swear words bring the fluency out of you, man. It's, it's what we first learned. Megan McPeak, what are you reading or streaming this week? So this is the interesting situation. I am, uh, at the time of uh, this recording, I'm actually later this afternoon going to get my laser eye surgery done. So I will not be streaming or reading anything for the next few days to alleviate oh. the strain on my eyes. Oh, so this so is- So please this means... send your podcast recommendations. <laughs> oh, okay, perfect. So this means I'm about to be the only person on this panel with glasses, but hey, you know what? I can take it. I like standing out. I like being different, but good luck with the surgery and I will, uh, text you some podcast recommendations. Uh, Dave Zirin, what are you reading or streaming this week? Now, first and foremost, good luck with the surgery, Megan. My goodness. Seriously. Um, uh, second, you know, it's got a lot of sex and it's got a lot of violence, but the greatest show I've ever seen is on HBO Max. It's called Warrior and it's based on the short stories of Bruce Lee it takes place in 19th century San Francisco, and it's about the Tong Wars with um, all Asian protagonists dealing with Irish police officers, corrupt politicians, and it is a wild, amazing show. It was canceled after two seasons, and there was such an uproar, they're bringing it back for a third. Watch Warrior, please. Wait a minute. So in addition to everything else Bruce Lee did, he also wrote fiction? Yep. Wrote some short stories about just being Chinese and immigrant in San Francisco in the 19th century and kicking all kinds of ass. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Okay, I'm going to look that up. Okay, so welcome back to season two. I think this is week five of Bring It In with Morgan Campbell. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell, here in, uh, I'm in Ajax, Ontario now. I'm back out of downtown, back at the crib, as you can see. Still working on the book, just not on the retreat anymore, but I don't do this by myself. I'm here every week with the best panel in the business. We have Hamilton's own uh, Megan McPeak, who is based in Washington, D.C. these days, and as she told you, about to uh, get her eyes fixed, and also in Washington, D.C honorary Canadian, uh, author of 10 books with an 11th on the way, Dave Zirin, uh, Dave um, Washington Mystics. That's right. Zirin. We do. He's right. Hey, let's, we got to record you doing that and make it an NFT. Um, <laughs> put some more money in your pocket. I am usual. Uh, am your host, Morgan. Cam I, as usual, am your host, Morgan Campbell. Um, and I didn't give you a book recommendation off the top, but I'm going to give it to you now. Um, the book I recommend people read. It's not a sports book. It's called Arguing with Zombies. It's by an, an economist named Paul Krugman, who's also in, uh, a columnist at the New York Times. And it's a collection of his columns and his essays dealing with um, ideas uh, that survive, um, misguided ideas, faulty ideas, easily debunked, debunked uh, repeatedly debunked ideas about the economy that, that somehow survive. And he says, and in the introduction, he explains how this is like arguing with zombies. These ideas should be dead but they keep getting up and I gotta keep putting them back to bed. So I'm gonna collect all my writings on all these zombies here uh, and let you guys read. And so hopefully we can put these zombies to bed once and for all. And I thought of that book because no matter how many times people who know about track and field tell you that a fast 40 yard dash does not project into a fast 100 meter, 100 meter dash time that the fastest guys in the NFL aren't necessarily the fastest people in the entire world. You cannot convince football fans, football media, mainstream media who only parachute into track and field every four years. You cannot convince them otherwise until someone puts it to the test. And once the test happens, you see the difference between NFL fast and track fast. And for a day, everybody says, oh, wow. And then next year, I promise you guys, we're gonna be still having the same debate. So yesterday, because we record on Monday mornings, Sunday afternoon, DK Metcalf of the Seattle Seahawks lined up at the Mount Sac Relays in the men's 100 meters. And let's remember how this all started, was that D DK Metcalf had that iconic end-to-end uh, -end chase down tackle on Buda Baker. His top recorded speed during that chase was 22.64 miles per hour, which doesn't necessarily mean a lot to a, 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 a sprint nerd, 10.1 meters per second, which caused football writers to start doing the math and calculate that if he maintained that speed for 100 meters, he'd run 9.88, which the football writers said was faster than a lot of track people. Uh, that analysis leaves out a lot of variables and you can't reliably project based on 
one data point from somebody's GPS, what their 100 meter time is going to be. You have to put it to the test. So DK Metcalf, to his credit, put it to the test. He signed up, lined up, uh, and got smoked in track and field terms, right? He lost his heat by a quarter of a second. But the interesting thing is DK Metcalf ran 10.37 seconds in the 100 meters. He got last in his heat. But for a guy who has not run track since high school, um, spends most of his time playing football and just trained three solid months uh, to run track. 10.36 is a more, 10.37 is a more than respectable time. This would be like, uh, Terrell, remember when Terrell Owens used to say he would play in the NBA? Um, if, you, if, if Terrell Owens made the NBA, you put him in the NBA for one night and, he's, and he had more points, and he had more points than turnovers, more points than fouls, that's a successful night because for the most part, they throw you into the NBA. All, there's nothing you can do but foul out. So DK Metcalf um, surpassed my expectations, ran 10.36. Dave Zirin, uh, what, how did you react when you, when you saw the results and saw the footage of the race? Well, first and foremost, it reminded me of footage I once saw of Jadavian Clowney running track when he was in high school. I'm sure you've seen that footage, Morgan. Just yes. seeing someone so much bigger and so much clearly stronger than everybody else, still pretty much keeping pace. It's just an amazing sight aesthetically. Uh, that was my first thought. The second thought was that I was thinking about, with all due respect, Morgan, all the track and field nerds who were putting DK Metcalf down in the weeks leading up to it. And that was real. That was real yeah, on yeah. social media. And I was just like, nah, you should be absolutely like thanking DK Metcalf for the attention that he's bringing to the sport. Yes. Let's give him some love for that. And then the last thing I thought was one of the things as someone who does, uh, you know, I'm a youth sports coach and I care a lot about youth sports. One of the things I can't stand is the youth sports specialization. Thank you. The idea that you should only play one sport year round because that's the way you're going to be a pro. There are so many reasons that, that that's wrong, not just physically, but also mentally and socially that I can't even get into them all on this show but suffice it to say dk metcalf showing off this idea that you can be a multi-sport participant yep. and be successful and actually engage i mean his love for track and field bursts out of his chest and that, that's a beautiful thing and i think that's something that's actually terrific modeling for mm -hmm. young athletes to see yeah, it's funny, like the two groups of people that were most down on DK Metcalf in the aftermath were like the hardcore track and field snobs who are very much like boxing fans and that they love the sport so much that they almost hate it. And like, no matter what happens, <laughs> they're going to find something to complain about. And then like the football people who actually thought DK Metcalf was going to be faster than Olympic sprinters and think that because he finished last in the heat that this in his heat that this was some type of failure because they don't have context for that type of speed all they've ever seen is football speed so the, they think the fastest football person necessarily is the fastest person in the world but like context and again they're laboring under all these false expectations because that 9.88 was an absolutely fake number pulled basically out of thin air and you can't measure anybody against that because the number of people in the world in a given year that run 9.88 or faster is like i don't know three four <laughs> right so someone's not a 235 pound guy is not going to come straight from the gridiron and do that but i you know if you'd asked me i would have said hey anything Faster than 10.6 and no injuries, that's a great day for T DK Metcalf. He got through it in one piece, uh, significantly faster than 10.6. So that's a great day. Megan, what did you think of the run? I thought it was great for the exact same reasons that Dave mentioned and just giving the track, uh, track and field community some eyeballs that without DK Metcalf would not have been paying attention to this race. And they got to see the potential of who could be in the Olympics in a couple of months. So I thought it was fantastic. The fact that, you know, you got extra eyeballs. It's always great when you can get extra eyeballs on any sport that wouldn't have necessarily been there, but you know, a huge respect to him because he put his ego on the line. He put yes. his pride on the line and he put it on the line with all the talk he had been doing, you know, with, with the lead up to it. And he said, you know what? I'm just gonna go out and I'm gonna run this and I'm gonna see how I can compete and how I can compare. He could have easily just kept talking and talking and talking and never actually put his pride to the test and put his yes. speed to the test. But he put all of that aside and said, you know what? If I think I can beat somebody, if I think I can run this, you know, this 100 meter and I can do it quicker than people expect me to, I'm gonna prove it. So he put everything on the line 
to go out and simply just prove that he could contend with the best of them. And I think truly he did to your point, you know, 10, 10, three, no one expected him to run that fast aside from the football people who thought he could run it in nine, eight, which let's right. be real. A lot more analytics go into the actual speed of sprinters than just taking the GPS from end zone to end zone on exactly. turf with cleats, which are completely different than track cleats and a completely different surface. Like, you can't just translate it that way. It's it's not it's like the US exchange with the Canadian exchange. Dollar for dollar doesn't always work when it comes to currency here, people. <laughs> exactly. But you know, I, I have to give him his respect because one, he put he put everything on the line and two, he put in a speed that no one no one really thought he was gonna be able to do. To your point, 10 six was gonna be fantastic. And you know, biggest thing is no injuries. Seahawks are pretty happy about this. <laughs> Injury free. He can go into minicamp. Dave, were you gonna say something? No, no, I, I oh. Megan nailed it. Um, although I, I did have to say, like, like the people who said that a football player could it would translate to track, just a- also aren't keeping into account issues like a running start on a football field. Yes, adrenaline on a football field. I mean, it's it's like people who who look at like the hundred meters that someone might run in a four by one hundred race. And, you know, when they're getting the running start and being yep. past the baton and saying, my goodness, if they could only do that on 100 meters, it's a complete lack of understanding. Oh. Um, I spoke to a Wyoming Atias, 1968 track legend, go. and she was telling me about the arthritis that she has now in her fingers mm-hmm. because of all the years of pushing off those fingers to run right. track. I mean, that, that's a very intense physical operation, and people don't realize the the full-body athletic endeavor that goes into it. Yeah, okay, yeah. and two two last points, is and one day, this will be near and dear to your heart, right, is that a lot of the, 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 the fascination and speculation around this is generational, and it has to do with the fact that it's been a few years since we've seen something like this. But if you grew up watching sports in the 80s, you saw this basically every offseason. We had the NFL's fastest man competition and the fastest guys in the league, and some of these guys were ex-Olympic sprinters. They would run against each other, and you would actually see who was the fastest in the league instead of all this talk about it. And the person that won most of the time was Dave's boy, uh, the king, the original king of the chase down tackle, Daryl Green, who was a legitimate uh, sub 10 one sprinter. And when you saw him play on the field, you it, it was not a surprise. But back in those days, you would see the Herschel Walkers of the world run in the off season at big time track meets or Bo Jackson, Deion Sanders. These guys have competed in high college track at a high level. You can actually go look up their times. You don't have to guess how fast they are, but Today's point, we're in, a, we're in a different era now. Everybody wants to specialize early. Um, and also in the social media era, there's a lot invested in the idea of being the fastest as opposed to having to go out and prove it, right? And the race is the truth. And the, and the, what fascinates me about audiences is that, and we in the sports media as well, and we really need to do a better job of, of context, contextualizing these things, but we are more... Uh, fascinated with like what might be than what we already know is. So if we had gone back 10 years ago, right? Trendon Holiday, little short guy. He was like Tyreek Hill. He's faster than Tyreek Hill in a straight line. Um, played for the Broncos, played for the Texans, but he uh, he was an NCAA champion in, in the 100 meters. Now, if he had said, I'm trying out for the world championship teams this, this year, people would said, oh yeah, well, that's a tough team to make. We'll see what happens. DK Metcalf says, oh, I think I can make the team. Everyone's like, well, of course he can make it. But like, which of these guys actually had the statistics that would allow you to make that projection? It's the guy who uh, won the NCAA title. But like that type of data actually makes it, having that much data on hand makes it less interesting to the sports media world who would rather talk about this stuff and try to talk uh, speak into existence the reality of DK Metcalf being as fast as Trayvon Brumell. And that's just not it. And Last point, because we Canadians know uh, firsthand the pitfalls of bad track and field math uh, for journalists when in 1996, Bob Costas declared that Michael Johnson was faster than Donovan Bailey because he took the 200 meter time, cut it in half and said 9.66 times two equals 1932. Ergo, the 200 meter guy is faster. To Dave's point, the second 100 meters has a running start and that makes all the difference. And so if there's a lesson here, it's, two lessons. One, uh, it's refreshing to see DK Metcalf put it on the line in an old school way, the way Daryl Green, Ron Brown, Willie Galt, uh, Herschel Walker, Google these guys if you're too young to remember them, the way they used to do it every winter. Um, And two, sports journalists, uh, before you throw the numbers around, figure out what they mean. Help yourself, help your audience. Uh, Meanwhile, in Japan, there's yet more drama surrounding the Olympics. Naomi Osaka, 
one of the very one of the two or three best women's tennis players on the planet uh, re will represent Japan if there is an Olympic Games. But she has come out over the weekend and said she's really conflicted. She's skeptical. She's ambivalent about holding these holding these Olympic Games in Japan. Her quote to the AP: "Of course, I would, I would want to say I I would say I want the Olympics to happen because I'm an athlete and that's the sort of thing I've been waiting for my whole life." But I think that there's so much important stuff going on, especially in the past year, uh, referring to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I think a lot of unexpected things have happened and it's putting people at risk. And if it's making people very uncomfortable, then it definitely should be a discussion, which is what I think of it as right now. Megan McPeak, how uh, influential do you think Naomi Osaka's uh, opinion and her ambivalence uh, about this event how much do you think that's going to weigh into the into the decision uh into the decisions on how to proceed with this event well i think the way that japan supports their athletes when they have success even if it's minor success of you have a player that gets drafted to the nfl the nba the nhl whatever it may mm -hmm. be they celebrate them with jubilation and the way that they've celebrated Naomi Osaka with the way that she's been able to come on the scene uh, as a tennis player and, and dominate, especially when you see her go up against a Serena Williams, who's arguably one of the greatest tennis players, and I specifically said players and didn't specify the gender, that the world has ever seen. Yes. Uh, so if, if they are going to celebrate them when they're successful, they should very, very clearly open their ears when they have things like this to say regarding the situation and the virus and the Olympics. It doesn't mean that they have to do what she says in the hopes of, you know, if she feels that it needs to be postponed, canceled, whatever it may be. It's the simple fact that you have your own athletes asking for more discussions to be had ahead of the Olympic games. If they celebrate her when they're successful, they should also be able to listen to what her and her fellow Japanese athletes have to say about hosting the Olympics. Because at the end of the day, the hosting nation puts the pressure on the shoulders of its athletes. She, mm -hmm. along with many other Japanese athletes across the board in different sports, will be carrying the burden of having to be host, hostess, when it comes to the Olympic Games uh, in Japan in a couple of months. So I think that if, if she is feeling pressure, if fellow Japanese athletes are feeling pressure, they should be listening and want to have a open line of communication as to what their concerns are and have a dialogue about what is going on. Yeah, and they also put the pressure, uh, the Olympic Games put the pressure on the shoulders of the citizens, of, of the everyday citizens of the host country, everyday citizens of the everyday residents of the host city. Again, we've discussed this before. Um, upwards of 70% of Japanese people told, uh, do not want the games to happen, at least not this year. Uh, around 2% of the population is vaccinated uh, as of right now. At the same time, the IOC is making public pronouncements, doubling down on Rule 50, saying we don't want dissent, we don't want protest, we don't want people in Black Lives Matter t-shirts. Well, one way, uh, one surefire, uh, un unsolvable way one surefire way uh, to prevent people from wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts at the Olympic Games is not to have an Olympic Games. And this is what the IOC is flirting with right now because people in Japan are upset with the fact that the IOC wants to bring over 15,000 people. Dave Zirin, shouldn't the IOC be concentrating on something a little more pressing uh, in terms of the coronavirus than whether or not someone wears a BLM t-shirt? They certainly should. I mean, you mentioned it, Japan, the, the infection rate, 1.8%, uh, uh, but only 10,000 deaths because of the culture of wearing masks in Japan has been very collective and very strong. But th this is a this is a country balancing on the head of a pin when it comes to the coronavirus. They are so susceptible and so vulnerable at this point. And I've been saying this for weeks, you know, th th this is going to be a razor's edge situation, whether these Olympics take place or not. They, they think they're too big to fail. They're not mm. too big to fail. And all credit to Naomi Osaka, because, you know, there's a difference between being Eddie Vedder and Mick Jagger. There's a difference between being a rock star and megastar legend. Naomi Osaka right now is Eddie Vedder. By, by winning a gold medal at these Olympics, she would be Mick Jagger. 
because of what Megan said. I mean, the collective sporting culture in Japan is really intense. And if she's able to bring that level of national pride in a sport that Japan has not historically uh, dominated in or, or even competed in, I mean, so she's risking her own station, you know, mm -hmm. in the pop cultural firmament by even saying, I have questions about these Olympics. And, you know, we've seen Naomi Osaka be outspoken on issues of police violence and the fight for black lives. So on the one hand, we shouldn't be surprised that she would also speak out on this front. But on the other hand, this takes a lot of courage because she's putting her own, as the expression goes, skin in the game uh, when it comes to where she is going to be um, culturally at the end of this summer. So I give just give her a lot of credit for doing that because one of the things she's doing, and this is what athletes do at their best, is she's amplifying the mass concerns mm -hmm. that exist in Japan. She's not coming up with this because she woke up one morning and said, gee, this is bad. She is amplifying what the polls are saying, what the people on the street are saying, what the people who've been you know, removed from their homes are saying. I mean, so, I mean, I give her a ton of credit because this is where we are right now. The Japan Olympics are not too big to fail. Yeah, well, two things, Dave. One, yes, it would be easy for Naomi Osaka just to think about herself because she herself, can she create a situation at the Olympics where she's not exposed to the coronavirus? Of course she can because she has money. She has sponsors who have money and they can essentially sequester her, keep her tested, keep her safe, keep her away from other people. Cool, but she is talk. she's not talking about herself. She's talking about everybody else who's going to have to run that risk. And somebody in her position, the easiest thing for her to do would just to become, would be just to become a cheerleader for the games. And she said, oh, yeah. I'm not just going to become a cheerleader for the games. Like I'm still mm -hmm. here and I still understand the criticism and I understand the danger. And we are going to address that, like whether you like it or not. And you're going to listen to me because I'm more, if you don't listen to the janitor, if you don't listen to the ER doctor, if you find reasons not to listen to all these other folks, you're going to listen to me because, because when these games comes, you're going to try to put my, po my face on the poster, my face on the billboard. But here's what I have to say, because I'm not just going to become a spokesperson for the game. So yeah, I don't, Dave, I think they're going to go ahead with the games. And what I think we're going to see is like with, with the, what, what the NFL had in the fall is they're going to treat com the completion of the 16 days as a success, regardless of how many people get sick, wind up in the hospital or whatever. And if 15,000 people come over, 500 of them get sick, hmm, cost of doing business. We finished the games. That's a success. Everybody come pat us on the back. Meanwhile, Megan's fate. Well, go ahead, Megan. I just want to add, um, and yes. I have absolutely no insight into any insider information, but there, in my opinion, I think there's three athletes that could completely turn this on their heads. Mm -hmm. And it's Naomi Osaka, Yuta Watanabe, and Rui Hashimura. Mm -hmm. The three biggest names right now in sports that could be potentially playing in the Olympic Games for their host, for the host country. If the three of them at any point decide it's not worth it, I think Japan realizes there's a problem and may end up doing something different and drastic. But I think they, those three, those three athletes have a lot of power and name mm -hmm. recognition when it comes to J Japanese sports culture right now, uh, especially when you think of hosting the Olympics with tennis and basketball. Right. Yeah. And it also it's, it's on the IOC. The IOC has money. The IOC has resources. What I don't understand is why isn't the IOC going to the Japanese government and the local government in Tokyo saying, what can we do to help you get this pandemic under control mm -hmm. so we can have these games? If it's not an ideal situation, OK, we get it. But we have resources. What can we do instead of worrying about <laughs> whether your T-shirt has a black fist on it? Like they need to have uh, a different set of priorities. but. Again, we'll see. I think they're going to push through and then celebrate on the back end just as long as nobody dies of the virus during the games. They're going to call it a success. Uh, Megan's favorite sports executive, Mark Emmert, and Dave's favorite governor, Brian Kemp in Georgia. They're cooking something up in terms of uh, getting players paid. So this last week, uh, Mark Emmert told, told the New York Times that he is going to push for the NCAA to adopt uh, uniform rules allowing athletes to cash in on their name image and likeness so this is different from getting a salary to go play basketball at duke this is more like a lot this is more uh allowing you know rj barrett when he was in school to go sign an endorsement deal with the local dodge dealership with gatorade possibly whoever so what's happening is uh, individual states are adopting rules saying it's legal in our state if you come here and play college sports and sign an endorsement deal 
Um, and so what's happening is any state that doesn't have a, a, a law like that on the books uh, is at a competitive disadvantage. Because if I can go to Florida um, and sign with the local taco shop and get free tacos for my whole time in university, plus get a little money, um, and I can't get that in Alabama, then I'm going to go to Florida and Nick Saban's not going to be happy. And so uh, what the governor of Georgia has said is, yeah, we're going to adopt a similar law. We're going to allow college athletes to get paid. Um, but two things. Sorry, the, in Florida, you have to take a financial literacy uh, test as a college athlete before you start collecting uh, this endorsement money. And in Georgia, what, Brian, what Republican Governor Brian Kemp says and keep in mind, Republicans the whole rest of the time are against redistributing wealth downward. Don't like taxes when you say, hey, I need more taxes to pay for school. Shut up. We don't want any taxes around here. But what they're saying to college athletes is, you make this uh, endorsement money. You don't keep it. We're going to put it into a pool and redistribute it amongst all the athletes. Now, if I take a financial literacy course, the first thing they're going to teach me is not to let somebody swindle me out of my money, which sounds like what Brian Kemp is trying to do to student athletes in Florida. Dave, uh, how backwards and regressive is what Brian Kemp is suggesting in terms of name, image, and likeness and sponsorship money redistribution? How backwards, racist, patronizing, where's my bigot thesaurus? Uh, <laughs> so I can figure out where we put Brian Kemp on the grand scale of things. I mean, the guy is Lester Maddox without the charm to raise the issue of another Georgia governor. I mean, is there any doubt which side Brian Kemp would have been on in the 1950s and 60s on the question of Jim Crow? We don't have to answer that question because we see what side he's on on the questions that face uh, people today, whether we're talking about voting rights or whether we're talking about this issue with name, image, and likeness. To me, it's very connected because it's about not seeing your black constituents as actual human beings. Yes, of course, this affects all athletes, black and white, but we know this is focused on the sports, the revenue produce, producing sports of football and men's basketball, which rest on a foundation of black talent. And to have Brian Kemp come out with, with such a patronizing, bigoted, condescending approach to name, image, and likeness, I mean, it sends such a message, and it's not a message to college athletes, and it's not a message to the NCAA, who by by the way, are gutless and not coming up with their own name, image, and likeness rules that would be on a national level. The whole issue of state competition with one another has to do with Mark Emmert not having the courage to actually put forward what the national plan would be and begging these local governments to bail them out with their own plans. But it's, it's not only about that. It's about Brian Kemp doing this as red meat for his own base. That's what it's all about. These folks, I got to tell you, they, they don't even see this as the United States of America anymore. They see it as the Republican states of America. And so what they're saying, what Brian Kemp is saying to his white constituents is, yeah, this is how we're going to control them, you know, because we know you like being entertained by them. So yes. this is how we will exercise control. And I'm sick of it. You know, I'm sick of Brian Kemp. I'm sick of, you know, of them putting this, putting out messaging like this throughout the country, because I think it's absolute poison when the solution is so obvious, because it speaks to the, the very marrow of how business is done in this country. It's like, if you have the fame to exercise financial uh, leverage with your name, image, and likeness, you get to capitalize on that. That's the way yes. it would be the case for anybody else in a university, except for this separate group of people. And so this is where Brian Kemp is coming from. It's a message to a base of voters, the only people he feels accountable to, that their college sports will be controlled and corralled Georgia style. Absolutely. And think of the fact, too, that this is how college sports works basically anyway, without playing, without paying the players, right? If I'm University of Georgia, uh, this football team, men's basketball, to a lesser extent, women's basketball, they bring in all this money because when you bring it, when you, when, you, when you ask about paying players, the response is, well, if you pay the players, we can't afford to run these other programs. And again, essentially what they're saying is football, men's basketball, a lot of, a lot of players, a lot of black players, a lot of them from just normal working class backgrounds are being asked to subsidize student athletes who come from sports where your participation in that sport is a signal that you have money. So why should uh, Zion Williamson, already he brings uh, an estimate of $5 million per year just by showing up at Duke, he's worth that much. But that $5 million doesn't go to him, it goes to uh, 
Tanner and Becky on the sailing team, right? On the tennis team, on the golf team. These guys growing up, they had money. You know how they have money? How you know, how we know they have money? Because they're sailing, they're playing golf. And that type of re income redistribution is underway already. So now what you're saying is the type of fame you're going to have now isn't even necessarily dependent on the school. This is you. This is why it's your endorsement deal. And if Reebok is paying you $100,000 a year, we're going to take 75 of it and give it, um, again, to Hunter, even though Hunter's parents make a combined 400 grand a year. Why? Like That's not even just redistribution. That is theft. That's backwards Robin Hood. Megan McPeak, what do you think? <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, I don't understand to your point how if I am, you know, a Charlie Collier who was the number one overall draft pick in the WNBA this year out of Texas, why I should be paying for other sports. At the end of the day, if you make it a, make the ability for uh, players to have name, image and likeness, guess what? That means that endorsement companies can actually endorse the sailing team. You can have sailing companies yep. endorse them. You can have golf companies endorse these golfers. You can have lacrosse companies in course, uh, in, endorse the um, lacrosse players. You can have canoeing, kayaking. They can have companies that are specific to these sports coming out of the woodworks to endorse yep. these players and teams. So why is it that you should be utilizing the basketball players, the football players, in some capacity, baseball teams, because some, some schools have fantastic baseball programs that bring in a lot of revenue. Why should the big revenue players and sports be paying for other ones when if you give the ability to have name, image, and likeness, that opens up the door for everyone to have yes. a level playing field with regards to getting endorsement deals. Now with regards to make it making it on the state, guess what? It is a complete advantage when it comes to recruiting. It's no different than the NBA and the WNBA when it comes to coaching. You cannot play for a uh, team and work for an NBA team in the same uh, market mm -hmm. and make what your counterpart would if they didn't play. So for example, there's a reason why when Christy Tolliver was on the coaching staff with the Washington Wizards and playing mm. with the Washington Mystics, why she had a specific salary that really irritated and frustrated a lot of player, a lot of people when they found out how much it was that she was getting paid. There's a reason because within the collective bargaining agreement, that was looked at as a competitive disadvantage to teams who didn't have NBA teams in their market mm -hmm. when it came to recruiting free agents and bringing them yeah. in. Oh, hey, guess what? If you come play for us, we can pay you in the off season $125,000 as an assistant coach. And you don't have to go overseas to play to make up that income loss that you would if you are playing for a team that doesn't have an NBA team. There's a reason that pro teams do this. So yep. you shouldn't have the you shouldn't have the ability in the NCAA to pick and choose what states get to have name image and likeness. If Alabama gets to have it and Georgia gets to have it, guess what? So does Rhode Island, so does the smaller schools in the Midwest, so does the non-power 5 conferences. If you're going to give it to one school, you've got to give it to every single school so every single athlete, no matter of their sport, gets the ability to try and make money when you're getting money off of the likeness and the name of them on the back of their jerseys anyways. Also, Megan and Dave, like Georgia's bigotry is going to backfire. It's going to backfire because the whole the whole reason that name, image and likeness in one state versus another is uh, an issue is that it gives the NIL states advantages over the ones that don't have these laws. Now, if you're a Georgia and your law comes with this big caveat, right, you have to give three quarters of your endorsement money to all the rest of the people. OK, you go make that pitch to a five star recruit from Atlanta and the coach from Auburn drives across the state line and says, you can come here get your money and keep all of it. Where is that kid going? He's not staying in Georgia to give three quarters of his money to the uh, equestrian team. He's going to, he's going to go to Auburn. He's going to go to Alabama. He's going to, he's, he's going to sign with his drink sponsor and keep all that money. And so we'll see what happens. And I, I, if these things wind up happening, I think we know Georgia will find out quickly that bigotry does not pay. Um, Moving on, because I see the clock ticking down, we're going to get to this real quick. Uh, in or out, last three topics of the week, we're going to find out if Dave and Megan and I are in or out on some of the hottest topics out there. Saturday night, this is a fight I got to write about a little bit for the New York Times. Uh, Saul Canelo Alvarez knocked out Billy Joe Saunders, which stopped him after eight rounds. Billy Joe Saunders retired in his corner. Basically, what happened was 
Saunders leaned into this right uppercut, got punched right in the eye. Canelo Alvarez, after he hit him, he went back to his corner. He said, that guy's not coming out of the corner. I think I broke his cheek. Like he could literally feel the bones breaking when he punched the guy in the cheek. Uh, Saunders retires in his corner, fight's done. Boxing Twitter predictably uh, erupts in a debate over Billy Joe Saunders quitting in his corner. He's a quitter. He's a bum. He's a hypocrite. Megan McPeak, are you in or out on boxers in the middle of a fight saying, no mas, I'm done? Was it Billy Joe or was it the medical staff saying, hey, he just broke your face. This is over. Like that's at the end of the day, if he knows his face is broken, I probably am going to retire and say, you know what? I, I can't take another punch because I could end up with a bigger injury, more serious injury. So I, I'm definitely in on a player. If a player knows their injury is is serious, I'm in on them being able to make the decision that, you know what, no more for me, I'm good. But if it's just, I'm too tired, I think I'm going to lose by judge's decision. But man up, woman up, get back in the ring. <laughs> you raise an interesting point, Megan, about broken bones and how logical it is to stop fighting when you break a bone, uh, which makes you, again, more logical than like 90% of the people talking about this on Twitter. Dave Zirin, you in or out on a fighter saying no mas. 1964, February, Sonny Liston sat on his stool and Cassius Clay became the heavyweight champion. If it's good enough for Sonny Liston, it's good enough for any fighter. I'm sorry, this is the way it is. And Roberto Duran didn't say no mas because he quit. He said no mas because Sugar Ray Leonard tied him into a knot and he yes. just didn't do it anymore. So that's just part of the fight. It's not quitting, it's actually part of boxing. You might as well be against technical knockouts if you're against people quitting on the stool. It's part of the fight. It's one of the ways in which you lose. Well, absolutely, and okay, here's the thing. Much like the discussion we had at the top of this segment, people get lost in context. In the fighter that you're calling a bum or a wimp or a quitter for quitting on his stool, like that person is already tough. They've gotten to the point where they're in a title fight. They've already endured all kinds of adversity. They've hurt, they've hurt themselves. They've hurt other people. They fought with broken hands. They fought with uh, teeth missing, all of this. And so if they get to the point where they say, this is too much, they have a very good idea of what's enough and what's too much. And this is what I say to... Uh, Anybody listening, whatever your job is, um, if you, in the course of doing your job, suffer a broken face, call it a day, man. <laughs> Don't get out here with a broken face to please me or to please your boss. There is not enough money in the world, especially to please these boxing fans. Most of them bootleg the fight. They don't even, so like the attention they pay, that's the only thing they pay you. They're not putting money in your pocket. Psh, you break your hand, you don't feel like fighting anymore. Quit. I'm not going to hold it against you because you're a lot tougher than I am because I would not take a single punch from Canelo Alvarez, and much less go in there with no right eye against the guy who throws left hooks. He's punching my blind spot all night. No, quit. No dishonor in quitting. What is it? Not a chance. Boxing I'd like, to, like I said, anybody who, anybody who called him a bum and a quitter, I'd like to see them get in the, get in the ring for eight rounds right. with Canelo Alvarez. Like, come Who's, on. Who is fighting Canelo with one eye? Nobody. This is crazy. Um, horse racing, speaking of like sports that used to be super major and now are like celebrated only a few times a year, we got horse racing doping drama. Medina, Steer Medina Spirit, who won the Kentucky Derby, has tested positive for an anti-inflammatory. Uh, Medina Spirit is trained by Bob Baffert, who is like, uh, like the Bill Belichick of... of uh, horse racing trainers, not just because they both have alliterative names, because he, but because he wins all the time. Uh, probably the winningest trainer ever, at least of this era. Uh, so my question to you is, Megan McPeak's second leg of the Triple Crown is coming up, um, and then there's another leg later this uh, spring. Do you suspend the horse or just the trainer? You in, Sorry, you in or out on suspending the horse or just the trainer? I am I'm in on the suspension because at the end of the day, the horse can't say yes or no to being injected with a PED that they're not supposed to be taking the day of a race. Mm. So I think Churchill Downs suspending Bob Baffert was the was the right move, especially too when you think of the fact, uh, full disclosure, this was his fifth, fifth horse this year. 
that had tested positive for PED or a substance that was banned when it comes to horse racing. So I think Churchill Downs got to a point where they were just fed up with the fact that, hey, bro, this is your fifth one. Uh, maybe we should call it a day. So I have all the respect to Churchill Downs making this move, especially when you think of the fact that history is attached to Medina Spirit with that Kentucky Derby Kentucky Derby win. I don't put any of this on the horse because like I said, horses can't talk. So if they did, maybe they say no, but this is all on Bob Baffert. <laughs> we'll see what the second test says, but the writing is on the wall. I think Churchill Downs feels that this was a correct test and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I um, it's we're five tests, Megan. We're past coincidence territory. I'm not a horse racing expert, but it's just that when when five of your equine athletes test positive, we are not in a coincidence situation anymore. And like you are guilty at the very least of like negligence because somebody is getting to all your horses and it keeps happening and you're not running a more secure ship. So I am all in on uh, on Medina Spirit. If it's if it's if his owners can find a new trainer, continuing to run because to your point, Megan, it's not like uh, like in 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 human sports, the coach might be completely blind to what the athlete's doing. The athlete might get a call from another athlete saying, "Hey, meet me behind the gym. I have the secret to getting 15 extra pounds on your bench press." And you go back there, and he opens up the duffel bag, and then there's all the pills and syringes. That's not happening. Like. Uh, uh, Smarty Jones didn't say to Medina Spirit, meet me over by the breeding stall. Okay, we'll wait till there's a session on so there's noise, no one will hear, and you and I will discuss uh, what it really takes to win the Derby. That's not happening. This is 100% on the trainer. Uh, he needs to serve a suspension, let the horse run. Dave Zyron, you in or out? Yeah, I mean, I'm all in on suspending the whole lot of them. I mean, Bob Baffert is Bill Belichick if you're talking about Spygate and Deflategate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he reminds me so much of Lance Armstrong. You know, there was no greater uh, person who was more outraged about steroids than Lance Armstrong until it was found out that he was the Tony Soprano of steroids on his bicycling team. Uh, you know, not just user, but distributor. I mean, Bob Baffert <laughs> is the worst of horse racing. I mean, there, there are two kinds of people in horse racing, people who love and positively worship these magnificent animals and what they can do, and people who actually are hurting them through the process of being in these races. And so th these kinds of injections, steroids, what have you, that's become part of the Baffert MO, it's actually hurting the horses. So, and, and so if we're not celebrating what these animals can do, but we're in the active process of exploiting and hurting them, they have no more place in the sport than Lance Armstrong had in cycling. Perfect. Bob Baffert well, and Bill Belichick are actually good friends too. Ah. <laughs> doesn't surprise uh, me. The, I so leading up to the Kentucky Derby with the sports betting show I do here in DC we were talking about it and there oh, yes. was uh there was an interview that they did for the lead up to the Derby on Derby Day an interview with Bob and Bill um so yes they are actually uh good friends now so much makes so much more sense it's like when Context. I watch the right it's like when I watch the SWV versus Escape versus and uh, Escape saying softest place on earth. And they were like, yeah, Joe wrote this song. And I'm like, man, nothing in the world makes more sense than learning Joe wrote the softest place on earth. OK, Megan, thank you for that missing piece of the puzzle. Last one uh, to tie a bow on a couple of conversations we had one at the top of this uh, episode. And another one we had a few weeks ago about Scotty the Scooter Miller from uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers claiming uh, claiming erroneously that he could outrun Tyreek Hill. But now we have some data on DK Metcalf. 10.36 seconds in, in the 100 meters. That is impressive linear speed for an, a non-professional sprinter. Um, and so now what I want to know, Megan McPeak, you're up first. Are you in or out on 10.36 sec, 10 second 100 meter DK Metcalf uh, outrunning current Tyreek Hill over 100 meters. Like on the track or on the field? Yeah, no, on the, the track meet, track meet rules. Yes, yes. Explain. I think because because of the training he had in the last three months, if you give if you give Tyreek Hill training, the same training, same three months, mind you, DK Metcalf will have three months already under his belt of training and he'll have the technicality of how to get off the blocks. But I think if you give them the training and you give them 
the ability to get ready for the race, I think DK Metcalf has the experience in his bag to be able to beat Tyreek Hill in this situation. Hey, all right, that's a bold take. Dave Zirin. Me more in or out on on current you in or out on current DK Metcalf beating current Tyreek Hill, Hill over 100 meters track and field rules. I'm all the way in. I mean, Morgan, you know as well as anyone that so much of track and field is mental. I mean, the lay person thinks you're just getting out there and running, but so much of it is about pace. So much of it is about psych. So much of it is about what's between your ears. And DK Metcalf just put himself under the brightest possible lights to show what he could do. And he came out looking like a winner even coming in ninth. Tyreek Hill will go out there, and I believe that just because of human nature, part of him would shrink from the moment, and DK Metcalf will be looking behind him, and he might as well have a <laughs> towel hanging from his back shorts that says, hey, what's up, Tyreek? Nice to see you. Interesting, and we are unanimous on this. Uh, I'm in on current current DK Metcalf beating current Tyreek Hill for some reasons that are more concrete. One of them is that we know now exactly how fast Ty, uh, DK Metcalf is, 10.36. The thing about Tyreek Hill is the last time we saw him running track in high school, he was 10.19. Um, but that was a long time ago. And football fans think you get faster playing football, but that's only if you're not already fast. If you're that fast, there's a lot of ways to get slower, not many ways to get faster. You don't notice it with Tyreek Hill because he's still so much faster than almost everybody else in the NFL. But all that time and all that football is going to wear some of the sharp edge off that speed. Like we saw a video of Tyreek Hill running against uh, Terrell Owens um, over the winter and like his technique, he is fast because he still has this big engine, but in terms of like sprint technique, the type of sprint technique that's going to sustain you over hundred meters, it's not really sharp these days. You'd have to go back to the lab and get that back. So if you just put them on the track today, uh, DK Metcalf wins, but you know who else wins every week is uh, me. I win because every Monday morning I get to hang out with Dave and Megan. This is my favorite 40 ish minutes of the week. Um, you guys will be hearing this probably Tuesday night. Uh, listen, we're glad you come back every week. Uh, if you like it, leave a like. If you dislike, leave a dislike. It don't matter. All engagements matter because we got to feed the algorithm. Leave a comment. Uh, tweet at us, hashtag bring it in. Let us know what you want to hear us discuss on In or Out. Megan McPeak, uh, between now and next week, tell the people where they can find you on Twitter at Megan McPeak, spelt with an H because that's yes. the correct way to do it. Perfect. Dave Zyron, tell the people where they can find you. At Edge of Sports on Twitter, although my feed has basically become a Russell Westbrook appreciation <laughs> right at this point. I'm doing free PR for the man and I have no regrets. <laughs> Perfect. And as usual, I am more your host, Morgan Campbell. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Morgan P. Campbell. Uh, another fun week, and we will be back faster than DK Metcalf can run 100 meters uh, next week. Looking forward to it. Hope you guys are too. We will see you.